Hi. You're good. I don't know what I'm going to say most of the time. And come to think of it, most of us don't know what we're going to say. But I'm a professional. I don't know what I'm going to say for a living. I'm an improviser. I make things up. So it's a little weird today to be talking to you about improvisation using a script. It's just bizarre. I think the world would be a much better place if everybody was taught improvisation. Improvisation, for those of you who don't know, is creating something instantly using only what you have in the moment. It is something that Michael Jordan, uh, Jackson Pollock, John Coltrane, the CEO of Twitter, and the fictitious television hero MacGyver all have done. <laughs> it's not just about comedy. It is about a skill set that is about creation and adaptation. Whether it's transferring the ball from one hand to another in midair to avoid it being blocked, or to getting out of a locked room using only a paper clip, a pickle, and some pocket lint. <laughs> That's improvisation. Improvisers are taught to say yes, to work as a team, to accept your ideas and make you look good. Improvisers would rather create than destroy. Improvisers will modify their status to match yours to make you feel more comfortable and relaxed. Or they'll raise your status if they think that you need to feel in control. You're doing a great job, Bob. We're all behind you. Or they'll raise their own status if they feel you need to be taken care of. Don't worry, Bob. I've got this. Improvisers view mistakes as gifts. They are successful when they embrace failure. They view failure as an opportunity to make something better or to create something new. Now, what if we all did that? Uh, now, improvisation has a lot of schools of thought, a lot of points of view about it. Uh, it's been around for a long time, so there's a lot of barnacles of opinions attached to it. But at its core is an amazing skill set that is incredibly helpful and I think life-changing. So here's my definition of narrative improvisation, why you should do it, and a little history and a little context. So I work with a theater company in Los Angeles, Impro Theater, and we create full-length plays in the styles of famous authors and playwrights. So we make up an entire play with sets and wardrobe and sound and music, uh, but no script no format, no plan other than to do the best Shakespeare, Chekhov, or Jane Austen-esque play that we can. We are writing the play as we say it in front of the audience. We are actor playwrights. So how do you prepare for such a thing? Well, like jazz musicians who practice their scales before they go off to the club and jam, we rehearse the genre. So for example, with Jane Austen, we read her books, read her letters, steeped ourselves in everything of the Regency period that we could. Then, on the night, we get a suggestion from someone in the audience, and from that single suggestion springs an entire Jane Austen play, not written by Jane Austen, <laughs> but written by us as we say it on stage. The next night, we get a completely different suggestion and create a completely different Jane Austen play, once again, not written by Jane Austen. We are creating new characters and new stories that might have existed in her world. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what characters we're going to be. We just know it's unscripted. Now, we've done our homework, so we're letting our brains and our bodies channel the muse. It's a form of mindfulness. We are not planning ahead or thinking ahead. We are just dealing with what's happening in the moment. And as you can imagine, failure is part of the process when creating this kind of theater. Uh, it is both terrifying and uh, exhilarating at the same time, not knowing what's going to happen next, kind of like life. And to add to the complication, uh, there are seven of us on stage. So we have to surrender our individual agendas and work together as a team to create this piece of theater. We don't know what's going to happen. The audience also is participating. They've given us the suggestion to start the whole show. They're 
they are partnered with us. We have a different relationship with them than maybe they would have with a scripted piece of theater. Because they gave us a suggestion, they are not only observers, they're stakeholders in the show. They are invested, just like you're invested when somebody likes your idea or accepts your point of view. So, what does this work have to do with changing the world? Well, uh, improvisation is something that we all do. Every one of you, you may have done it walking in here today, you probably uh, met somebody for the first time and exchanged a little bit of information. You improvised a little bit. Um, improvising is something that we should all learn how to do. What if you learned how to do it because most of your life is unscripted? Here are skills that apply to your life being unscripted. You could learn how to do this, okay? Improvisation stimulates your brain in a way that you will enjoy. It stimulates your body. It will continue to stimulate you as you grow older. It's very stimulating. People who interact with you will be more stimulated by you. Improvisation creates a, a sense of play. In short, improvisation is good for you. I became an improviser in 1986. I was fresh out of college, and I got invited to a theater workshop in San Francisco taught by Rebecca Stockley. Uh, and she was gonna teach us improv, and specifically the work of Keith Johnstone. And uh, Johnstone had written extensively, and still does write extensively, about improvisation. And we were gonna get four days of Rebecca, improv, and Keith Johnstone. Among the many things she taught us were, make your partner look good. Tell a story. Say yes and. Mistakes are gifts. Well, we were stimulated. Uh, we immediately formed an ensemble and began teaching each other how to teach improv using John Stone's book, Impro. Make your partner look good. Wow, yes, of course. So instead of thinking that every moment was all about me, and I was 23 at the time, so I pretty much thought that every moment was all about me, I would instead try and put my focus, my attention, on the other person. I would try and make my partner look good. And when I managed to do this, I felt a little bit of my ego and my anxiety disappear because I was listening to them. I was actively listening to what they were saying. I felt that at the time that I no longer needed to interrupt people. That was a, a, a way I behaved when I was 23. I was a very interrupting 23-year-old. Um, but that my success as an improviser was actually contingent on hearing what they wanted, what their needs were, and supporting them. So instead of waiting for their mouth to stop moving so that I could interrupt with whatever tremendous 23-year-old point of view I had at the time about whatever they were talking about right about the time that I stopped listening to them, I would instead hear what they said, which was genius to me at the time, actually understanding. And I began to see that these uh, dialogues were actually partnerships, that we were actually creating a little story. We were connecting together. Um, and I still have to remind myself of using these skills, especially in now our digital age of downward-facing cell phone, and people being distracted all the time, I actually have to remember, oh yes, put your attention up here, put your phone away. The more we are devoted to listening to what the other person is saying, the more engaged we are, the more successful that conversation is, the more resonant the life of that relationship is. We are much more attractive when we're curious about the other person. Imagine what a wonderful and sexy society we would live in if everybody made job one to make their partner look good. That's fantastic. Our, when we uh, started teaching, our students were, were very much not about engaging. Um, they were terrified of engaging for fear of being vulnerable. Uh, they didn't want to reveal any part of themselves, and this is only a small portion of them, but they were terrified of being vulnerable, and we were teaching them commit Commit to being a good partner. Commit to the story. Commit to being engaged. What's, what's it going to cost you? 
Being engaged takes just as much energy as not being engaged. So be engaged. But people are terrified of this vulnerability for fear of learning something new or being changed by their partner. They will go to great lengths in order to not have that vulnerability be present. They will not say anything in the scene. They will judge everybody else in the scene. They will talk over everyone without adding any information. Perhaps you've been trapped at a party with somebody like this. <laughs> what if they'd been trained as an improviser? What if they engaged you? What if you were trained as an improviser and made a point of trying to make your partner look good? Maybe they would sense that, let go of their fear, and actually ask you a question back because they felt that you were listening to them. Now, after that first workshop, I began to say yes and to a lot more things. I said yes to teaching improv, even though I had never taught improvisation before. One of my favorite Keith Johnstone quotes from that uh, first workshop was, no people are rewarded by the security they attain. Yes, people are rewarded by the adventures they have. I was having an adventure. Our little ensemble now had a school, Bats Improv, which still exists in San Francisco, and our students began to see the applications for improvisation in their work. And they said, hey, do you guys want to be consultants and teachers and teach us this at our work? And we said, yes, we would love to be consultants and teachers. And so we became consultants and teachers. <laughs> people uh, came to the classes for lots of different reasons. Some people just wanted to get out of the house and play. Some people wanted to be more creative or work on their writing. Some people wanted to engage more. Some people wanted to find someone to date. That was also one of the reasons. <laughs> but everybody loved to tell stories. They loved it. And this is the crux of the global improvisation plan, storytelling. We all tell stories. Like I said, you probably exchanged stories this morning when you met somebody in the lobby. We exchange stories all the time. Our main delivery system for information is storytelling. If you think about it, vines and tweets are little stories. Horrible clickbait online is the promise of a great story. You'll never believe what happened to blank. I have to know what happened to blank. Click. I have to know the story. We all tell stories, and yet storytelling, narrative improvisation, is not a required subject in school. But I know I use it more than algebra. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with algebra, and as an improviser, I'm very excited to find out what X is. <laughs> What's the story with X? So we understand each other through story, and I I think narrative improvisation should be part of the global syllabus. I think everybody should learn how to tell a story and improvise. Uh, it, it will transcend language barriers because we'll all be engaged, we'll all be supportive. And I have proof that this will work. Right now there are thousands of improvisers and uh, improv companies all over the world that get together at theater festivals uh, to make things up and work together. And they're not all performers. Uh, some of them are consultants, some of them are plumbers, some of them are rocket scientists and accountants. All walks of life who want to get together and be creative. And they, they don't always speak the same language. And it doesn't matter. They manage to have entire theater festivals where most people are speaking a different language. It's incredible. It's a microcosm of what could happen if the global improv education plan is implemented. In that first workshop, way back when, uh, we were taught that mistakes are gifts. And I really believe in that wholeheartedly. Uh, if you can accept that whatever happens in the scene is perfect and go on, the portals of opportunity really begin to open up. Improvisers are trained to deal with what is happening in the moment, not what could be. Last spring, uh, during an improv theater show, uh, we were doing an improvised Shakespeare in Pasadena, and an earthquake happened. The, uh, the lights began to swing back and forth. The audience started to whisper to themselves and think about bolting. The actors froze, except for the two actors on stage who took this moment during an improvised Shakespeare play for their characters to fall in love. 
You do move me, Melinda. <laughs> I do feel the very earth beneath my feet roil and quake. <laughs> I'm sure if the earthquake had gone on a little bit longer, Melinda would have led everyone to the exits in the form of a rhyming couplet. <laughs> but they yes anded an earthquake. I think improvisation can make your life more resonant, resonant and joyful. I think it can help you approach failure and conflict as opportunity. I think improvisation can help improve your relationships personally and professionally. Here is something that everybody in the world does, but only a few people are trained to do. What if everybody learned how to improvise? Thank you. So, they've asked us to improvise for you. That was not improvised. Um, so I'm going to bring out my wife and fellow improviser, Edie Patterson, who's bringing your suggestions that you gave us in the lobby. Edie? Hi. <laughs> so since we were talking about uh, Jane Austen, we're just going to do a Jane Austen scene using some of your suggestions and make trouble for people who are coming on after us. Um, so, what's a typical location in a Jane Austen novel? What was that right there? A drawing room. Thanks very much. We will now take you to a drawing room and use your suggestions. Miss Green. Mr. Winthrop. We are alone and unaccompanied. Yes, I, I didn't hear you come in. I, I simply came in here to drink some hot tea. Yes. Well, failure is one step closer to success. And by moving towards you, I feel I am one step closer to successfully knowing you better. Mr. Winthrop, I can't help but being offended by the fact you, that you assume I will fail drinking this tea. Oh. Oh, you have not failed. Failure is surrendering to fear. Fear not the hot water that now stays the Persian. It's interesting you talk so much of failure. For I think that success is a beautiful wife, a beautiful house, and a beautiful car. Did you say... And these are things that I've been thinking about, and I've created something in my mind called a car. But it won't come about for many, many years. That's what I love about you, Miss Green, the fact that you're so forward-thinking that you would invent something that, that doesn't exist except in your heart. Did you say what you love about me? Yeah. Success is independence, oh. and yet I would bind myself to you. You would? Yes. Well, I believe that failure is failing. And when I say failing, I've ironically spelled it F-A-L-E-I-N-G. <laughs> Miss Green, live your passion with me. Mr. Winthrop, I would love to. <laughs> Thank you. 